three pharmaceuticals. Um, this is sort of a, a different focus than what you, what you spent the morning on, uh, understanding what the community is doing about uh, pharmaceuticals and the environment. Uh, myself and Beth and Shimaloy, uh both are uh, oceanographers and uh, trained oceanographers, and so our focus has really been more of an environmental focus in terms of uh, how we're reaching out to communities on collection events. But our project came about because communities were coming to us looking for um, help in holding collection events properly. Um, obviously, some of this information you can probably already know, but we look at pharmaceuticals and include the personal care products, cleaning agents, cosmetics, etc. There's been a lot of discussion around the mosques, things like that. Um, what we do know is that pharmaceuticals are produced and used in larger volumes each year. Um, 2006, over $274 billion was spent on over 3.7 million prescriptions. Um, I wish we had a number as to how much of that has been discarded or is, is to be discarded, but we really don't know how much gets discarded. Um, consumption has increased significantly in the last 20 years, and the UN is projecting a threefold increase in the next 25 years. So this is just not something that's going away. Um, why do people throw away their medic medicines for all the obvious uh, reasons? I'm, I'm on uh, slide three, I think. Disposal of unwanted medicines. Sorry about that. Um, we know that. Changes in prescription result in lots of medicines being left in the cabinet. Um, people not finishing their prescriptions, people getting better. Um, patient death, patient death is a very um, important issue because what we know is that when the coroner goes into the home of most people, they are in fact um, flushing the medications. They specifically document them all and then flush them. So um, our focus is we've uh, started to, to talk up and work with more of the coroners um, around the Great Lakes as well. Next slide. What, what we do know about people's disposal habits from surveys, um, and there's been a few, this is just one of them, is that about, uh, you know, 50, 40 to 50 percent, depending on the survey, people are putting them in the trash. 35 to 40 percent, people are saying they flush them. Um, and the remainder is, is uh, other aspects. But um, so we do know that there's a fraction of the drugs that are being flushed. Um, why is this an issue? We do know, we have heard uh, wastewater treatment plant operators tell us about times when large influxes of things like pharmaceuticals have come through. Um, they've actually um, killed all the bacteria and shut down the facility. So stop the facility from even being able to function under certain conditions. This is typically wastewater treatment plants that obviously are, you know, have a uh, pharmaceutical industry nearby or something nearby that does that. Um, there's also been lots of discussion about damage to septic systems similarly. Now, if you think about a lot of antibiotics going in there and killing all those good bugs that we need, um, this is an issue. Uh, the environmental impact, obviously, we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, accidental ingestion, this is the poisoning that's going on. Um, Lots and lots of children are treated. We are now hearing more and more sto stories of older adults who are accidentally poisoning themselves and killing themselves. And actually, another one here is a huge cost to in the vet industry. There's a lot of pets that get into medicines, either because somebody put them in the trash or they dropped them or whatever, and um, uh, medical costs for, for pets. And then probably the biggest driver right now for a lot of communities is the uh, illegal use, especially by teenagers. There's something called farming, P-A-H-A-R-M-I-N-G, where children and teenagers steal drugs out of their parents' cabinets, take them to the party, throw them in the bowl, and take a handful. Really, really stupid, but serious problem. In Milwaukee's collection of vets are all driven, for instance, because they're seeing more and more cases. The police, this is a really serious issue. 5% of teenagers age 18 have abused Oxycontin um, alone. That's just one of the controlled substances. So if you have teenagers, talk to them about pharmaceuticals, um, drugs getting stole up, stolen out of homes. Uh, we've just heard stories about people who have had their homes up for sale and people specifically come in to view the home only to steal their medications because there's a good street value. So. Um, and then the issue of a, a really um, a waste of criminal care dollars, all these medicines being thrown away. And, and we've had some collection events where they've calculated how much has been thrown away, and it's quite significant. 
We do know that when we're looking at pharmaceuticals in the environment, we're looking at a lot of sources. Next slide. Um, so the entry pathways are diverse. We have some data about how much is coming off the farm in terms of antibiotics. Um, and we probably, uh, but I don't know that we have data on uh, hormones being used on farms, but there we have those, those medications um, going right from animal to the soils to the waterways. So um, that may be our major source of uh, pharmaceuticals getting to the environment, but we don't really know that split very well. Next slide. Um, there are a lot of issues to, to the proper disposal of pharmaceuticals, uh, communicating the issue, lack of conclusive research, that's the piece that we're talking about today. Um, we're telling people to do something proactive when we don't really know exactly what the size and the scope of the issue is. Um, and collections and programs for collection of pharmaceuticals are, are very complicated, they're very difficult, and there are a lot of legal aspects to it. So next slide, um, what Melanie and Grant has done is put together a toolkit um, for communities. So communities come to us, they want to do a collection, we provide them with a toolkit which has um, just all kinds of information and useful tools to figure out how they're going to hold their collection, if they want to do a one-day collection, if they want a permanent collection, however they want to get into um, collection of control of uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, next slide is just a list of some of the things that are in it. Um, this issue is obviously very hot in the news. There has been a lot moving on the legislative front. We have all the legislation from all the states um, in the toolkit. Uh, one place where this issue has been, is really complicated, and that's in the nursing homes, assisted living facilities. So we talk about some of the ways some of the states have worked um, to make it a little simpler to collect those pharmaceuticals. Um, and we talk about drug donations and some of the issues with that. Um, there have been a lot of problems with drug donations to other countries. And um, so we try to provide the committee with all the tools they need to, to get a community on, a collection underway. Uh, next slide talks about the types of collections uh, going from you know one-time consumer events, one-day events, short-term collection campaigns. Sometimes people will collect um, for several days in a row, uh, once once a year, and then sort of permanent collection approaches, and then um, finally a mailback programs. Um, and mailback programs seem to be there's some indication that we may be looking at mailback programs over the long haul as a national solution. Um, the next slide talks about what, how to successfully collect um, drugs. The Drug Enforcement Agency is. Um, is very much involved in this issue, although not very um, participatory. Um, their whole key is avoid the diversion. They do not want to see drugs get to the wrong hands, um, and therefore there are significant uh, regulations and rules um, that you must follow when collecting pharmaceuticals. There's obviously, of course, uh, privacy uh, issues associated with it. If, each of the states have their own regulations going down to how to, who can who can actually handle the material, how can it be transported, what are the rules for transportation across state lines, all sorts of things, and the need to always have police involved um, in all of these collections. The next slide talks about some of the things that make collection events successful um, and why we think they can be successful. Um, they, they tend to be great. Uh, education opportunities people start to think about when they get an opportunity and they show up for collection they think about how those medicines get into the waterways um, for the police they've got good events for outreach and, and public interaction um, and there has to be a really wide mixture of partners you know people will be looking working with the with the senior community through our through various the triad various organizations that are older work with older adults and they develop great partnerships that they use for other things in their communities. Um, and people are coming up with some very creative ways to address this issue, most of which the DEA decides are illegal, but they're coming up with interesting ideas that you know, may lead to, to, to better solutions in the, in the long run. Um, the next slide is on the challenges. Um, and again, it's the, the Drug Enforcement Agency is, has very specific rules about controlled substances. Um, most Narcotics are controlled substances, and some other chemicals are also controlled substances, but there's no easy way to know when you have a drug if it's controlled or not. 
Um, and there has been no, no movement by the DEA to give anybody any wiggle room on the collection of these medications. Co collecting uh, pharmaceuticals is relatively, can be relatively expensive, so funding is often an issue. And um, the bond rule talks about how when you do collections, you're taking the responsibility off the, the producer, so you're taking away that extended producer responsibility. The manufacturer no longer is um, being held responsible for something he produced that somebody else doesn't want. Um, the next slide shows a couple of examples um, the one from one-time events. Really large um, sums of drugs are being collected. Uh, it's very, very fascinating to go sit at one of these collection events and just, just watch car after car after car bring in shopping bag after shopping bag after shopping bag full of medications. Um, we seem to still have a lot of drugs out there in our in our medicine cabinets across the country that people don't want and have not, haven't had a way to get rid of, um, and we still think there's a lot more out there. Next slide talks about some of the permanent collection facilities uh, across the country um, and places uh, where people are, are setting up programs. Um, putting collection bins at police stations is becoming a popular approach because you have the police already in place um, and that, that could be a relatively expensive option if you just have to get people to go there. Um, very few pharmacies have been able to do to take on this issue both because of the drug uh, enforcement agency regulations, um, costs, all sorts of things. So the idea that we could be a model, we could follow what Europe has done, what um, Australia has done, what other Canada has done, which is take them back to the pharmacy, is a town model that appears like it's going to work in this country without a lot of uh, regulation change. Uh, the next slide talks about mailback programs. Um, Maine is the only state I know of at the moment that has a mailback program underway. They have a very unique situation in that the state has its own drug enforcement agency who has decided to take a different approach than the federal DEA. And so they are have a mailback program underway. Um, and um, several other places are launching pilots. Uh, Wisconsin just launched, launched a mailback pilot where they will not be accepting controlled substances. They'll accept everything else. And uh, we believe the DEA will be watching very carefully um, how that goes. The next slide talks about uh, Solid Waste Agency in Northern Cook County and their program. They're going into um, the same location sort of month, every single month and doing collections. Um, and this has been quite successful. They have a transfer station and they're using the fees they collect at the transfer station to fund the program um, for collection. The next slide is some data from Wisconsin on what they're collecting at these events. This is, um, there's probably maybe 10 or 15 collection events out there across the country where they've actually collected very specific data about everything collected. Um, this kind of tells us of what we expect to see um, in the environment and also what people are throwing away. The idea is that maybe we can start to look at some of this data and um, go back to the source, find out why so much of any particular drug is being thrown away and maybe uh, we can convince doctors to uh, prescribe less or figure out different approaches so that we're not throwing away so much medication. So um, this is an extremely labor intensive uh, effort to get this kind of data, um, and, uh, but we're, we're starting to collect some of it. Next page down just talks about how um, the whole uh, collection programs are being driven by controlled substances, which in this case had, had, were 3% of the total of what they collected, so a very small amount, and we see anywhere above, you know, Three to ten percent of what's collected is the controlled substances. It tends to be a, a small percentage. There are also the hazardous chemicals. Um, several pharmaceuticals have, are associated with liquids that are um, hazardous, or things like warfarin, which is blood thinner, which is also rat poisoning, and that's a hazardous chemical. Um, so there are some of those out there as well. Next slide. Uh, what is still needed? Um, we know that humans, pets, and livestock will be taking medications forever, so um, it's not like we're going to stop all medications. So eventually we're going to have to find um, ways to treat um, what's coming into the wastewater treatment plant. We're going to have to develop those technologies, and that research um, is underway, but um, of course it's, it's like every other technology due to the wastewater treatment plant. It's very 
very expensive. Um, we're starting to see some of the first designer medications coming out, medications that are designed for the individual. Um, blood pressure medicine, I think, is one of the first ones they've been focusing on because so many people are on blood pressure medicine. So now we're going to have not just that, those thousands of chemicals, we're going to have an infinite number of chemicals because the chemicals will be, pharmaceuticals will be designed for individuals, and so um, our approach will have to be, you know, sort of adapt for that. And then we don't really understand the, the, how, the difference between how much pharmaceutical is excreted when you take a medicine. Um, you hear from the pharmaceutical industry anywhere from 90% of most drugs is taken up to 90% of most drugs are pushed out. So um, that's, a, that's a big question. And then how much is just being flushed out in the toilet? So what is that balance between um, what we're excreting um, and what is being thrown away. So when we go to a collection event, we're, we may be going after just a very small piece of the pie, but people no longer will want in their homes. And then there's the question of how much medication or how much of these pharmaceuticals are coming off the farm versus from human use. Um, and we know something about how much antibiotics are sold at the farm, and it's probably, it's quite, it's a lot more than what humans are taking but it's a different disposal, it's a different um, pathway. We've been focusing on, also starting to focus on um, curbing the waste of medicine, trying to address, get to doctors and talk about uh, prescribing and thinking about what they're prescribing. Of course, they're prescribing what patients to some degree are asking for, so um, we don't know how far we can get there. And eventually we just have to provide simple solutions for, for individuals, for hospitals, for pharmacies, um, to make this successful. And um, so that's what we're, we're working towards, finding models that work in those various environments. Um, next page shows the in, our entire toolkit with background on the information, talking about the environmental impacts, um, all sorts of information on legislation, uh, the research that's going on, et cetera, et cetera, is all on the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant College Program website, which is at the top one, and the second one is the EPA's uh, pharmaceutical website uh, site. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions.